we believe that this message will be a blessing to you so I want you to stay glued and watch to the end and share to bless others this is Christocentric we have a lot of Apostle Eric Nyamiche's message on our platform kindly check them out thank you for watching stay blessed now the past two years we have been dealing with a glorious church the theme for 2020 was a glorious church to possess the nations the idea is that we wanted to make the church beautiful so that the world will accept or receive the church's testimony because we want to possess or transform the society now if we are moving into the society we must package ourselves such like that the world will be able to receive us the church ought to be attractive you can't transform the nation when you yourself you are not transformed so we decided to look into the church proper and make sure that we live in holiness that the presence of god is strong and that god is with us in 2021 this year because we didn't have much space to deal with the glorious church we decided to repeat it but this time we added one word revived a glorious church revived to possess the nations what we are trying to do as a church is that we are praying and training and equipping every member so that every member of the Church of Pentecost will go out there and influence his or her sphere. We have not yet received um, the results of the housing and population census, but taking what we know, the population of this nation is about 30 million. Then we are also about 3 million. So you are looking at one Church of Pentecost member to 10 Ghanaians. So God is telling us this now because of the population that we have. He couldn't have told us when we were just 2,200. But now God has prepared us and we want to possess the nations. What we intend to do is that we refocus the churches so that we begin to preach about righteousness because it is only righteousness that will exalt the nation. Now, if we are claiming that 70 plus percent of us Ghanaians are Christians and we see all around us evil and co corruption, what that means is that the church is also involved in what is going on. Now, unless we reorganize the church and refocus the mission of Christ, we will not be able to transform the society, not at all. There are some who come to church on Sunday, holy, but on Monday, they think that it is business as usual. One elder told his pastor that, pastor, this one is business. There is nothing like business and there is nothing like spirituality. When you are going to church, you go with your spirit, you go with the Holy Spirit. You don't leave the Holy Spirit at home or your spirit at home and go to church. So that what happens there in the secular world, it is uh, maybe belongs to the realm of the physical, not at all. There is no dichotomy between our spiritual life and our secular life. So we want to kind of see that when you are a husband, you have to see being a husband as a calling. That you are called to be a husband. You are called to be a father. So that you, you play that role as if God has given you a charge. Now, when you are also employed in any company, you also have to go there as a public call. So all of us are called into the ministry. Now, in the Church of Pentecost, if you look at the percentage of ministers as against the entire population, we are under 1%. So if ministry is for only the clergymen, then... 99% of the people are rendered redundant. But the clergy are supposed to kind of equip all the members for the work of the ministry. So when we are talking about the ministry, it is what we do outside the church house. So all of us should prepare to have a ministry outside there. So that when you come to church, you come with the understanding to receive and then go and impart your sphere beginning from your home. There's so much work to be done. That is why God has established his church for the sake of transforming society. Now, when you see evil rising in the society, what that means is that the people 
or the church in that particular generation is not playing its role. But we want to arise as a church and then influence the others so that we can bring righteousness on board and then transform it. That is why we are talking about a glorious church revived. Now, what we are saying revived because when the church is not revived, we cannot have the energy to possess the nations. So we are praying that God will help us. The main theme test for the glorious church is found in Ephesians 3 verse 21. And I want us to project it and we will read together. Ephesians 3, 21. Ephesians 3, 21. Please have it if you can we read together. And to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and then he added what? Amen. So this is a statement, but it is also a prayer. It is a benediction and it is a prayer. It is a wish and it is a prayer. The wish of the Apostle Paul is this, that the glory of God will remain in his church from generation to generation. The most important feature of worship is the glory of God. The most important feature. Now when we come to church and his presence is not here, then we have actually not come to church. It is just like any club. The most important feature in worship is the glory of God. So the glory of God is the most important feature of worship. Why am I saying this? In 1 Chronicles 22, 1 Chronicles 22, let's read verse 5. I'm trying to recap some of the things I have taught here and then add a bit of today's one. First Chronicles 22, 5. Now, this is the temple David wanted to build, which God denied him and which Solomon, his son, was to build. And this is the image of the building that David had in mind. Now, David said, my son Solomon is young and inexperienced and the house to be built for the Lord should be of great magnificence. Now the house should be big. But it should not just be big. It must have some magnificence. It must be glorious. And the house to be built for the Lord should be of great magnificence. And fame. It should be spoken about. People should see the house from the outside. And then begin to gossip it in the nations. Because of its beauty. Then he says that. And splendor in the sight of all the nations. The church must be beautiful. It must be splendid in the sight of the nations. So that when anybody passes by that temple, and then he leaves Jerusalem and he goes to maybe Damascus, or maybe Samaria, or maybe to any place in Edom, they should talk about the glory of that temple sitting in Jerusalem. Now, the temple today is representing us. It's representing the church. Now, the church must be so glorious that the, the eyes of those who are beholding us, they will see some attraction that should be able to draw them to us or open up for us to go to them. Are we together? So, this temple is an image of the church today. Today, where God dwells is not this house. He dwells in me. And all of us together makes the temple of God. That is why Paul said, don't you know that you are the temple of God and that the spirit of the Lord dwells in you? It is you singular and you plural at the same time. When we gather together, the presence of God is here. When you are alone, the presence of God is with you. So when you are talking about church, don't look at the church of Pentecost. Look at yourself first. You are the primary church. And then when we meet together, because we come with him, he is in our midst. Are we together? So the church must be glorious. It must be splendid. It must be of great magnificence. It must be talked about. It must be talked about in the nations. But this glorious building is supposed to house two things. Verse 19. Two things. That is glorious temple. After it has been done, we host two things. Now devote your heart 
and so to seeking the Lord your God. Begin to build the sanctuary of the Lord God so that you may bring the ark of the covenant of the Lord and the sacred articles belonging to God into the temple that will be built for the name of the Lord. Do you see the two things that this house is going to host? Now, it says that so that you may do what? Bring what? The ark of the covenant of the Lord. That is one. And the sacred articles belonging to God into the temple. So this glorious edifice was supposed to house two things. The ark of the covenant of the Lord. Now what that means is that the presence of the Lord which can be interpreted as the glory of the Lord. Now, when the presence of the Lord is in our midst, the glory of God is also with us. That, that, then he says the holy articles, those days they will carry all the things that is used to worship, like the offering, bowls, and whatever. But in our time, the holy things of God, it's not the microphone, it's not the instruments. No, it is you and I. So when we come to church, two features must be taken seriously. The members who come and the presence of God. Are we together? The members, we are holy. And the Holy Spirit's presence or the Ark of Covenant signified by the Ark of Covenant in the past. So I'm saying that the most important feature in our worship is what? Is what? The glory of God. And the temple that is supposed to be built is supposed to contain what? The Ark of Covenant and the holy articles of God. Or the holy articles for worship. When the glory of God is present in this church, there are certain things that we see. The first one is worship and sacrifices are spontaneous. Worship and sacrifices are spontaneous. Where did I get this from? Second Chronicles chapter 7. Second Chronicles chapter 7. From verse 1 to 4. This is when Solomon finished praying. Fire came down from heaven and consumed them. Burnt offering and the sacrifices. And the glory of the Lord filled what? The temple. The glory of the Lord did what? fill the temple. The priest could not enter the temple of the Lord because the glory of the Lord filled it. So, between the priest and the presence of God, if the, the glory of the Lord is more important than even priests entering the church. Now, when the priest come to church and the glory is absent, it is no church at all. Because this gathering is unto him. So that when we gather and he is not in our midst, it is just like any other club. The gathering is unto him. So when we gather and he is not there, we have not gathered. It is useless coming here. And so God wanted the whole world to know and to understand that his presence is the most important. So the glory filled the temple like a cloud. And somehow the Bible says that uh, the priest could not could not simply mean that they attempted to enter. The Bible didn't say they did not because of reverence for the cloud, which represented the glory, but it says they could not. That is, they attempted, but the glory kind of pushed them out. They couldn't. So, now, so let's say that the glory of God is in the temple. That is verse 2. Let's take verse 3 and 4. Verse 3 and 4. When all the Israelites saw the fire coming down and the glory of the Lord above the temple, let's read together. They knelt on the pavement with their faces too and they worshipped and gave thanks to the Lord saying, He is good, His love endures forever. Now, who told them to put their faces to the ground? Who commanded them to worship? So you see how spontaneous worship is? When people see the glory, they offer themselves for worship. So let us make sure that the glory is in the church and we wouldn't struggle for people coming to church morning and evening. Sometimes we tend to uh, kind of 
How many thoughts why people don't come to church? But they should see the presence of God and that will be enough. Because in his presence, there is fullness of what we call joy. And there are pleasures that which makes people excited forevermore. So let us invoke the presence of God in our meetings and members will come. Then verse 4. Verse 4. Then the king and all the people offered what? Sacrifices before the Lord. Then, then all the king and the people offered what? Sacrifices. Now the word sacrifice has to do with blood. Has to do with blood. Has to do with giving up something that is so precious to you. But it wouldn't matter. People can give freely without compulsion when the presence of God is in our midst. Hallelujah. Are we together? So when the presence of God has so filled you, offering yourself for sacrifice doesn't become difficult for you. Even offering money for the things of God does not become a burden for you. There are certain people that when it's time for offering, they, they, they deliberately abstain from church. Not because they don't have, but because they find it difficult to give. They don't want to be convinced to do that. Are we together? So we are saying that when the presence of God is in the church, worship is easy. Sacrifices is easy. Then, when the presence of God is also in the church, there is the experience of the supernatural. There is the experience of the supernatural. The mystic. The unexplainable. The unexplainable. There was this lady... Um, who was a nurse we were having a prayer meeting in Tamale some years back and we just started the opening prayer and she was one of the few people who were around the time we started the opening prayer people were rushing in but she had come very early and I was also there very early our team has really prayed and we used to pray a lot for that prayer meeting then I saw that she would go out and then come in. But when she comes, she will hold the ear like this. And then I was just observing her. She will also just kind of hold the other ear. And then she will go out. So somehow she kind of was behaving a bit funny. And I was wondering what was going on. Then when service was about to close and we opened the door for testimonies, this nurse came and said that, for a long time, she had not been hearing with the left ear. The left ear was kind of blocked. But when she just entered the church house, and she was just praying and committing the service to God's hands, she just heard a sound in this left ear. And somehow she could feel that she was hearing from both ears. So she decided to go out and shout, closing this one, to check whether this left ear could hear and she could hear. So she would come into church and close this left ear. And then she was hearing with the right one. Go out, close this left ear. And then it was like the normal thing that would used to happen. So she would come in, close this one. And then she was hearing clearly. Then she would go out, close it. And she was hearing clearly. Now, she couldn't explain why. This is what we call the mystic. The supernatural. When the presence of God is in the church, these things are normal. And all of us should cause it to happen. None of us should come here and just warm benches. Don't be a passive member of the church. Don't think that the owners rest with leadership. Every one of us is part of this. We must all bring the ark of God with us into church. Come to church prepared. Pray in the night for the service. Don't sleep and rush here. No. Let us all be part of it. You can wonder the presence is here. There is the supernatural. And then when the presence of God is in the church, there is transformation. Transformation. Trans people are changed into the image of Christ. You can see with your eyes that people are repenting and becoming like Christ. There is even transformation in the surroundings. You see that people are able to do things that lifts the image of the church up. There's transformation. When the presence of God is with us, there is transformation. 
Hallelujah. But you see, let's go back to the prayer of Paul. Ephesians 3.21. Ephesians 3.21. The prayer is a wish. To King James who said, Unto him be glory in church by Christ Jesus through all ages, world without end, from generation to generation. Now, his prayer has two major interpretations, or three. The first one is that I've said the most important thing in the church should be the glory. And he is also praying that this glory will remain in the church from generation to generation. When you look at it at the flip side, what that also means is that the glory should be jealously guarded or we could also lose the glory in a particular generation. Are we together? If he's praying that the glory of God will be in the church from generation to generation, what he means is that the glory also can be lost. So all of us should jealously guard the glory of God in the church. Are we together? But the glory of God will stay with us. God will not leave us alone. He will not depart from us. God will continue to be with us. So we are now looking at pushing God's glory out of the church. And I mean pushing. Pushing God's glory. And the pushing is done by human beings, not angels. Pushing God's glory out of the church of God. Pushing God's glory out of the church of God. Now, we read Ezekiel chapter 8. And in Ezekiel chapter 8, God has taken the prophet Ezekiel. He was in exile in Babylon. And then he kind of sent him, this is a revelation, to back in Jerusalem to see what was going on in the temple. And then he showed him four scenes. Four scenes. The first one was an adulterous image which was placed at the altar. An adulterous image placed at the altar. Now this is a vision. It isn't physical. So they will go to church and there's no image on the platform. But in the revelation, he sees an image of an idol placed on the altar. And the Bible describes it as the image that made me jealous. That, that image made God jealous. Now, what does that mean? Jealousy is not evil. Jealousy is not evil. Jealousy is the love that holds to its own. The love that protects. Now, this image in the temple of God is going to compete for the love and the heart of the Israelites. So, but for the image, all Israel were worshipping Yahweh. Now this image comes and those who belong to him are now going to worship the image. And that is why the Bible says God is a jealous God. He is jealous over us. Now when you marry a wife or when you marry a husband and you are not jealous over the husband, then you really do not love the man. So jealousy is not evil. When somebody is nosing around and lurking around, and then you see that this one is, for, is hunting for your wife, and you are not jealous, you should be an evil man yourself. To not to be jealous. What that means is that maybe you are also in that soup, so you do not care. Otherwise, jealousy is not evil. Whereas envy is evil, jealousy is the love that protects but only that sometimes some women do it too much. <laughs> when even a mosquito is hovering around their husbands, they'll fight the mosquito. And so those are the things that we, we don't want you to do. But otherwise, jealousy is, is a display of godly love. So he saw that image. And then he saw 70 elders of Israel worshiping other gods. They had in their hands senses, and these senses were supposed to burn incense unto God. But they were not burning it to God. He says that there was an opening in a wall in the revelation he saw. And then he said, Break this wall. Go inside and see what is happening. And then he saw in his, the image 70 elders worshiping 
other gods. So that was the second one he saw. Third scene was women weeping for Tammuz. Now this Tammuz was a Babylonian deity, a Babylonian god. She's supposed to be a, a god of fertility. So when the land is dry, in the dry season, when there's no vegetation, people weep for him or for her because it's supposed that once there is dryness on the land, it means Tammuz is dead, temporary dead. So they have to weep for Tammuz. And the Israelite women were involved in the weeping for Tammuz. What that means is that they are in church, but they worship Tammuz. Anything that seeks and claims to give fertility and prosperity, people want it. People want it. And we have to be very careful. So that not because of the fruit of the womb, we will go worshiping other gods. Not because we want some job, we don't care the rings we go and put on our hands. Not because we want to get some money, we don't care about Sakawa and all this lottery. We must be careful about all this. Then the fourth image he saw was 25 priests who were also worshipping. 25 priests who were also worshipping the sun god. The sun god. Then God said that he was going to destroy Israel because of these images that he has seen. He was going to destroy Israel. Now you come to chapter 9. Chapter 9. Now, so let's go to chapter 9. Now, all these images are the things that the people were doing in the secret. That maybe the, the pastors were not aware. Even some priests were doing certain things in the secret. And God caught it. And God was displeased. And the glory of God leads with the holiness of God. Where there is that holy congregation or holy atmosphere, the glory lives amongst it comfortably. But when there is no holiness, God is checked out of his own house. So, now let's look at chapter 9, verse 3. Chapter 9, verse 3. Shall we read together? Can we stand up and read this one? So now the glory of the God of Israel went from above the cherubim. Please sit down. You know, these cherubims were representing the ark. You know, the ark of covenant had this cherubim on it. So it is like the seat of God. The ark signifies the seat of God. Then he says that the glory of the Lord of Israel went up from above the cherubim. So now God, the God has lifted himself off the seat. Off the seat. Now where is it going? Off the seat to where? Now the glory of the God of Israel went up from above the cherubim where it has been and moved to the threshold of the temple. The threshold is the entrance of the temple. So it has moved to the entrance of the temple. So let's hold that one. So it is no longer on the seat, but it has moved to the entrance of the temple. Chapter 10, verse 4. Then the glory of the Lord rose from above the cherubim and moved to the threshold of the temple. The cloud filled the temple and the court was filled full of the radiance of the glory of the Lord. So chapter 10 repeats that it has lifted up itself and it is at the door. The threshold of the temple. Now, verse 18 and 19 of the same chapter 10. 18 and 19. Then the glory of the Lord parted from over the threshold of the temple and stopped above the cherubim. Now, the cherubim was supposed to be carrying the glory of God. And then when he lifts, it, it lifts with the cherubim. So they came to the door, and now he says that the glory is where? Stop, departed from, departed from over the, the threshold of from the, the temple. From the door. Now it has departed. It is gone out to kind of the court. Verse 19. While I watched, the cherubim spread their wings and rose from the ground. And as they went, 
the wheels went with them. They stopped at the entrance of the east gate of, of the, the Lord's house. Now, and then read. God of Israel was above them. Now, so where is the glory now? Where, where is it? He says that, where is it? Um, at the entrance of the east gate of the Lord's house. So now the glory is not in the temple. It is not at the door. But it is at the east gate. What that means is that it is, it is now within the walls of the premises. So outside the temple is the court. And around the court is the gates. So it has left the temple, went into the entrance, went out of the door, went out of the court, and it is now at the gate. Now you don't call the entrance to this room gate. You call the entrance into the wall gate. Are we together? This one is door, and that one is gate. But in Ghana, every one of them is gate. Yeah, but this one is door, and then that one is gate. So now it is at the gate. See how the glory is lingering out of the church. Chapter 11, verse 22 and 23. Then the cherubim, with the wheels beside them, spread their wings, and the glory of the God of Israel was above them. 23. The glory of the Lord went up from within the city and stopped above the mountain east of it. So where is the glory now? The glory of the Lord went up from within what? The city. And stopped above the mountain of it. What do you understand by it? What is the correlation between the glory leaving the temple and the city? So I want you to say that. Just listen to it. The glory of God in the temple is for the benefit of the city. When the glory of God leaves the temple, then we cause the glory of God to leave the city as well. So the glory of God in the church is for the benefit of the nation. When the glory of God is not in the church, the nation suffers. The nation suffers. And it doesn't matter who becomes the president. We will still be battling with simple issues. But the church must rise and pray for the nation. Keep the glory of God in the nation and pray for the land. It must be relevant in its transforming power to the nation. Otherwise, why are you born again? Are you born again just to go to heaven? You are born again to be an agent of transformation. How many of us want the glory of God to depart from your life? How many of us want the glory of God to depart from your life? You don't want it. It is a glory that brings the blessings of God unto you. How can we cause the glory of God to stay with us? Read John chapter 8, verse 28, 29. John chapter 8, verse 28, 29. So Jesus said, When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you know that I am the one I claim to be, and that I do nothing on my own, but speak just what the Father has taught me. 29. Now, pay attention to 29. My question will come from 29. Uh, so pay attention. The one who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do what pleases him. The one who sent me is with me. If you like, his glory has not left me alone. Why? For I always do what pleases him. Now, so if you want the glory of God to stay with you, what will you do? We must always do what what pleases him. You see, when you are behaving like the priests in Israel, when you are behaving like the 70 elders, doing things in secret, <laughs> when we were boys, we used to sing this song, Have you heard it before? It's an ancient song. You may think that you are disturbing someone, but Let's rise and read verse 29 and our brother doctor will lead us in prayer. John chapter 8 verse 29 once again. The one who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone for I always do what pleases him because I always do what pleases him. 
God. Just want to lift up your voice. You want to thank God for the word that he has brought to us this morning. His word has come into your spirit. His word has come into your soul. His word has come even into your flesh. And it has a purpose. You just want to thank God this morning. Now, Lord, I thank you for what you are doing in my life this morning because of your word. I thank you for the power in your word. I thank you that this word has come to transform me. You just want to lift up your voice and begin to thank God. Just thank God. Thank God for the word. Thank God for the word. Oh, Jesus, we thank you, Father, for this morning. We thank you for your word this morning. We thank you for the transforming power of your word. We thank you, Jesus, the Lord, our spirits have received grace. In the name of Jesus, the Lord, we are becoming people who carry your glory. In the name of Jesus, because of your word, because of your word, Liba Sonde Basas, Mando La Rada Basai, Rabada Bado, Senda Bas, Sonde Brelen and Emes, Rabayada Bado, Sabrendos, Menda Bai. If you can speak in tongues, speak in tongues and commune with the Father right now. In the name of Jesus, Labalo, Sebrandesai. Lebara la da bado se branda la da bayasas la bo se de mande sa kenda bala na masai ilano ne mesende rambo sende ba kanda bara la na masai raba ya da bado senda ba ya da basai raba ya da do se bande ma kosanda raba ya da balo remba so tabiri ande raba ya da bado sanda ba yanda la na masai. Le paya da balose, elo briande sa tabadu landa le na mesa, elo shade kada da la da basai. In the name of Jesus, Jesus says that the glory of the Lord, the one who sent me, has not left me. He's always with me because I always do what pleases Him. The other day, David prayed a prayer, told God that God search within me. If there's any evil, if there's any wrong inside of me, if there's any sin inside of me, take away from me. And his purpose, his intent was that he would be plain before God. He would be pure before God. He would be holy before God. He would be pleasing unto God. This morning, you want to lift up your voice. You want to pray unto God. You want to commit your heart unto God. You want to say that, Father, I want to be the son that pleases you. I want to be the daughter that pleases you. If there's any sin, this is an opportunity to confess. If there's any wrongdoing, if there's any wickedness in the heart, if there's any grudge, if there's any hatred, if there's anything that impedes the glory of God from being present, impedes God from moving in your life, from manifesting his glory in your presence. You want to lift up your voice this morning and ask the Lord, take away from me. I surrender everything unto you and say, let your glory take over. Let your glory take over. Let your presence take over. God does not like to stare. God does not like to share. He does not like competition. He's a jealous God. So you want to commit your heart. You want to invite him into your heart and say, take control, Lord. Let your presence fill my heart. Let every hatred be pushed out. Let every, let every, let every sin be pushed out. In the mighty name of Jesus, Londo skemba rada da da basonda bayas raba ya da do senda brala na masai lo kadi barande mando senda le rebeses ikola pa yande belene meno se the Lord yande the Lord your church as members will carry your glory the Lord the nation will not suffer because we do not have your glory. That but we will be a church that is full of your glory, a church that will manifest your glory, a church that will carry your glory because we are the ones that please you in the name of Jesus. That because we are the ones that please you in our daily living in the church, we are pleasing unto you in our homes as, as children, as husbands, as wives, we are pleasing unto you in our workplaces, in our schools, as students, in our workplaces, as accountants, as doctors, as nurses, as physicians, as pharmacists, we are pleasing unto you. We are not only pleasing unto you in the church, but we are pleasing unto you in our homes. We are pleasing unto you in our workplaces. We are pleasing unto you in our communities. In the mighty name of Jesus. And so, Father, we say thank you. We give you praise. We give you glory for this morning. Thank you that, Lord, it is your desire that we will carry your glory. For which reason you've given us your word. We thank you for the effect of your word in our life this morning. We give you praise. We give you glory. In the name of Jesus, we pray with thanksgiving. Amen.
Everybody ought to love him. Everybody everywhere. Everybody ought to love him. him. Oh, punish every care. He's the altar of salvation. He's the author of salvation. Condemnation he prepared. Jesus died for everybody. Amen. Everybody everywhere. Jesus died for everybody. Jesus Christ on the cross has purchased salvation for everyone. If you see anyone who is an unbeliever, the person's salvation has been purchased already. But someone will have to show this one the way to access it. And that is the preaching of the gospel. Today, if you are here and you don't know Jesus, I want you to know that your salvation is fully purchased by his blood. And if you do not know him, and you want to accept him as your Lord and personal Savior. What that means is that you are not going to be condemned. Everybody everywhere should know Christ. Because Jesus Christ, God did not bring him to condemn the world. The Bible says that, but the world through him might be saved. If you are here, he didn't come to condemn you. That you are a fornicator, that you are a thief. It is because you are a fornicator, you are a thief. That is why he came. To rescue you from sin. Now if you want to give your life to him. Today is the day. Don't wait for tomorrow. Because tomorrow may be too late. Shall we bow down our heads now? If you want to give your life to Jesus. Wherever you are sitting. Just lift up one hand up. Lift it up high. Because without him you will be condemned. It doesn't matter how many years you have been in this church. A decision has to be made one day. And this is the day. Or maybe you couldn't lift your hands. Or when you lift them, we say, come. You are not able to gather the courage to come. As we bow down our heads once more, pray this prayer after me. And those of you here, please pray this simple prayer. Dear Lord, today I accept that I'm a sinner. And I acknowledge Jesus as my Lord. I repent of my sins. And I ask him to be my Lord and Savior. Amen.